welcome to our webinar, U.S. Customs Exams Explained. It's an interactive webinar and Q&A session, so feel free to submit your questions anytime throughout the webinar. You can go ahead and submit them right now if you have any. Um, you have a Q&A button on the top or bottom of your screen, and you can do that anonymously if you would like as well. Um, if we do not get to your questions during the webinar, then we will be sure to get back to you afterwards and follow up. So go ahead and submit it with your name included or email us afterwards with your question. Um, while you're submitting those questions, um, I'll talk about Scarborough for a quick minute. Scarborough is a full service international and domestic transportation provider. We are known for our expertise in customized solutions. We are also a US and Mexican customs brokerage firm and we offer warehousing and fulfillment services as well. We're headquartered here in the heart of America, Kansas City, go Chiefs. And we've got offices across the USA and close partners in every major port in the world. My name is Kim Taylor. I'm the marketing director for Scarborough. And we are lucky to have with us today, Caleb Hall and Debbie Roberts. They both bring a wealth of knowledge and years of experience and import operations and US Customs brokerage. So feel free to reach out to them, to myself. Um, anytime you have any sort of question, feel free to reach out. Um, I also want to mention if your company needs help or guidance um, in any area really related to international shipping, um, but especially today um, or when you can think of it after this webinar uh, in regards to your US Customs exams, uh, we're happy to help you and guide you through that. So um, feel free to contact us. We offer free consultations on supply chain optimization um, and just walk you through or help solve your problems there. Um, for those of you just now joining us, because I can see that we're still piling in, uh, feel free to submit questions via the Q&A button on the top or bottom of your screen. Um, and also I wanna let everybody know that you will be receiving a copy of this presentation along with some other resources after the webinar. Probably in a week or so, I'll have that um, all ready for you. So as long as you've registered for the event, you'll receive the recording. Um, okay, I guess I'll turn it over to Caleb now to talk about the subject that everybody loves so much, U.S. Customs Exams. Thanks, Kim. All right, well, hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Uh, my name is Caleb Hall, as Kim said. Um, I'm the brokerage manager here for Kansas City for Scarborough International. I've got with me Debbie, who's been with uh, Scarborough for uh, 20 years, uh, 40 years in the industry, I believe. So hopefully we've got uh, enough knowledge to share with you guys to kind of clarify um, what happens with exams, uh, what you can expect, um, and what you can do when an exam happens. I think that's kind of our general general goal here. So, um, just, thank you. Um, to start off, we're just going to go over what the purpose of a U.S. Customs exam is. Um, when you talk about U.S. CBP, there's a lot of things that roll around in people's heads. Um, you know, CBP is uh, Customs and Border Protection, so that's that's a multifaceted part of their job. Um, on the one hand, we've got the physical borders that they protect, both at uh, the northern border with Canada and the southern border with uh, Mexico. So, you know, part of CBP is to physically be stationed at those borders and, and contain um, any, any issues that happen at the border. Um, but another thing that people don't tend to think about is that we also have borders uh, on both sides of the country, on the east coast, the west coast, obviously a little bit south with, uh, you know, Florida and things like that. Um, and CBP is really responsible for, for protecting those borders as well. And one of the ways in which they do that is they protect it um, by determining what is at risk if it's coming into our country. Um, so their goal is to protect our nation's security, sovereignty, and prosperity, um, and our intellectual property and trademark material. And what that means is that if something is coming in that threatens, um, you know, Recently, the Section 301 and 232 tariffs were declared a matter of national security, and thus additional tariffs were applied. Um, anything that threatens prosperity, um, you know, you've got things like anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Those threaten the uh, prosperity of certain countries or certain companies in the U.S., and thus CBP 
is responsible for implementing uh, programs and things like anti-dumping and countervailing duties in order to protect the prosperity of those US companies that make those same items. Um, on the same vein, intellectual property and trademark material, that's really the focus of the Section 301 tariffs that have been going on for about a year and a half now, uh, maybe even a little longer than that, uh, pretty close to two years at this point since the investigations began. Um, so those are really some of the things that uh, CBP protects against. Uh, they're somewhat responsible for enforcing protection of the U.S. environment. Uh, that's mostly through things which are called partner government agencies, uh, things like USDA, FDA, EPA, Fish and Wildlife, anything like that. Um, you might know them as OGAs, other government agencies, as they, they were referred to back in the day. But once we switched over to ACE, the Automated Commercial Environment, uh, that terminology got changed to partner government agencies. Um, same, same organizations that are involved with, for the most part. Um, a couple of them fell by the wayside. A couple new ones popped up. And one of the things to remember about customs is they are the policing agent for all other government agencies. So USDA counts on customs to notify them if they see anything, if they hear anything, if they see anything on the paperwork, if they know anything, um, and FDA and Fish and Wildlife and on and on. They um, really depend on customs when they're doing their job um, of inspection of the paperwork and inspection of the shipment. Um, they count on them to police for them as well. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, that word policing, I think, is really important uh, because a lot of folks, when they have an exam with CBP, CBP becomes the bad guy. CBP is the one holding your freight hostage. CBP is the one who is, uh, you know, causing your freight to be delayed when you've got a deadline with your client. Um, and, you know, that's obviously something that is, you know, up to interpretation, it's, it's a perspective thing. Um, but just like with the police, you know, in your local city, um, part of their job is to just check and make sure that everybody is safe, check and make sure that everything is, you know, within the, the confines of the law. And when something isn't within the confines of the law, that's when they take action. Um, now, a, a customs exam, obviously, you don't necessarily have to have done anything wrong in order to have a customs exam on your freight. But if you think about it, let's say you are um, driving home on New Year's Eve. You've done nothing wrong. You're just driving down the highway. You've been to a New Year's Eve party. And what happens on New Year's Eve? There's DUI checkpoints. Those, or those police officers are going to stop every single person who's driving down that road regardless of whether or not they've done anything wrong in order to check to see if everything is safe, if everything is above board. It's the same with CBP. It works a little differently, yes, but at the end of the day, uh, customs exams, they examines things because they wanna make sure that the people of the United States are protected. On obviously, you know, at the end of the day, that can mean money out of your pocket if there's an exam, but the end result is the country is safer because of what they are doing. And it's really important to remember that. Um, despite the fact that you're probably going to get frustrated if something gets on exam for an extended period of time, um, it's just really important that we keep in mind that their goal is to protect the, the people of the United States, the commerce of the United States. Um, and that, that's really what the goal of these exams are for. Thanks, Caleb. And, and right off the bat, I've already got some questions um, piling in. Um, so I'm sure that you'll probably touch on that on the next slides, but I want to throw it out there. A lot of importers are asking why their shipments are getting stopped. Um, what are some things to consider? Um, you know, what can we do to avoid those exams? Sure, absolutely. So that is actually, like you said, part of the next slide. It's really one of the biggest things that people ask is why? Why is this happening? I've done nothing wrong. Um, you know, I made sure everything was set up cor correctly before I imported this, um, and, and still my shipment got stopped. So there are so many factors to, to consider with regards to customs exams. Um, one of which is um, customs exams can be flagged by individual CBP agents. Uh, those agents can flag because something tipped them off on the documentation. You know, they saw a discrepancy between what was on the packing slip and what was on the invoice in terms of, you know, 
your invoice says that this is made in China, but your packing slip says that this was made in Taiwan. What's going on there? That's going to cause a flag. Um, the downside to it being possible to be flagged by a CBP agent is um, CBP agents are human. Uh, sometimes they're in bad moods. Uh, sometimes they're, you know, being overly cautious and they just want to make sure that they catch as much as possible. Um, and, you know, on the wrong day, you get caught by the wrong CBP agent. Uh, there is that human factor. We're not going to deny that. It would be silly to do that. Um, but it is something that we've seen and um, we've called CBP agents. And I, I will tell you that if you call a CBP agent and you ask them why, they're, why they flagged a shipment for exam, I'm not sure there's a force on earth that can get an answer out of them. No. Um, because like I said to them, this is a matter of national security. Um, all you need to know is that something made them want to examine this container and they will let you know when they are good and ready. And they're fully within their rights to do so. They will let you know that too. Um, that they, um, uh, they're the ones that have the intuition um, when they see paperwork, when they um, see manifests, when they see ISF filings, to decide whether any of that triggers. And so there is that human factor. Yep. So um, that's one of the things to consider. Another thing to consider is the destination port. Um, much like uh, certain other parts of Customs and Border Protection, uh, such as you know how often they issue ISF penalties, destination ports have the authority to flag things for exam. Um, and if you bring something to a destination port that is different from a port that you've brought in in the past, let's say you've always brought in one product, you've always brought it in through the same port, it's always gone to the same destination, uh, let's say you always brought it to Kansas City, suddenly you're switching all of your product and now it's all going to Chicago. That is a red flag for customs. They wanna know why you suddenly switch destination ports. It could be as simple as my main customer base switched to you know, the northern part of the Midwest and now Chicago makes more sense. Uh, it could be something like you know, I uh, suddenly found that my ocean freight rate to Chicago was so much better, so I'm just gonna bring it there. All custom sees is that you've made a massive change to your supply chain and they wanna make sure that everything is staying above board. So you may see increased exams if you predominantly use one single port and you've switched that. Um, another big thing is specific commodities. This is honestly probably the biggest one um, behind maybe country of origin. Um, specific commodities are definitely going to be one of the factors considered with regards to exams. Um, if you're bringing in something that is food grade, if you're bringing in firearms, if you're bringing in something that is you know, toys for kids. Those are things that most likely are going to raise more red flags for customs because they want to make sure that those things are safe for the people of the United States. Um, you know, CPSC is gonna wanna see toys more often than, you know, they're just gonna look at, uh, well, CPSC only regulates so many things, but uh, you're, you're only going to see them flag certain items because those are things that they wanna make sure and come into the United States and are safe for the people using them. Uh, Specific commodities are targets, mm -hmm. as are the country of origin. Um, the country of origin, it, it might be one or the other, and it could be both. It could be a specific product from a specific country, mm -hmm. or it could be one or the other. Yep. So, um, and any commodities related to FDA, USDA, APHIS, Tosca, ATF, all of the above um, are also targets. Yep. Uh, and with regards to origin country, the political situation of that country comes into play. You know, we see uh, more shipments flagged, for exam, from places like Pakistan, um, anything coming from Venezuela, you know, places that are, are in a rough place politically, especially if they're in a rough place with the United States, you know, Turkey, things like that. Um, those are gonna have, have a higher exam rate because if there's unrest in that country, the US wants to make sure that that unrest does not overflow into the US and cause us concern. Um, so having something from those countries is definitely uh, going to increase your chance of having a customs exam. So while we're on that topic, I've got a question that just came in. 
Um, and this specific importer was asking why their shipments are all of a sudden getting stopped um, when their origin country is Vietnam. Okay. Um, right now, the reason that those are most likely being stopped is because of the Section 301 tariffs, um, because after the, imp uh, the implementation of Section 301, which for any of you who don't know is the, um, it's the additional tariffs, either 25% or 15%, soon to drop down to 7.5% um, on almost everything out of China at this point. Uh, very few items out of China don't have Section 301 tariffs. That was uh, started as an intellectual property issue. Um, I think it may be expanded to more of a political thing, but that's you know a personal viewpoint. Um, and at this point, what we're seeing is one honest and one dishonest practice. Uh, the honest practice is people are finding ways to get suppliers who are based in other countries that are nearby for the same commodity. So Vietnam is one of those places. Um, people who manufactured things in China previously are moving their manufacturing suppliers, well, not moving their suppliers, some of them are, um, but finding other sourcing in other countries nearby, such as Vietnam or Thai, Thailand or th Taiwan, things like that. Um, and what Customs wants to make sure is not happening is the dishonest thing that I was referencing. And that's the fact that some people are just using, they're making it in China, and then they're shipping it to Vietnam, Taiwan, whatever, and then claiming that that's the country of origin. That is why Customs is flagging more things out of Vietnam recently, especially, um, because they want to make sure that that commodity was actually made in Vietnam. And then it's not just a situation where the factory was in China, they shipped it to Vietnam, and then the shipping address is what's being used for the country of origin. So they're going, I won't call it a little overzealous because it's completely fair to double check. Um, but they're hitting that harder than a lot of other places because they know that that's a really common practice when something happens, like a new anti-dumping case hits. Suddenly people are looking for other sourcing uh, and, and they, they try and find the most honest way to do it. But unfortunately, like I said earlier, everybody's human and, and some people uh, are not always interested in doing the honest thing. They just want to avoid paying the duties. Um, and that's what ends up happening is something dishonest happens and someone starts claiming country of origin Vietnam when really it was just shipped through there. Excellent. Let's keep going. All right. So uh, another thing to mention is the change in tariff number, um, which is, again, another thing that's been really common recently with Section 301. Uh, having these additional duties of 25% on some items is causing a lot of people to really take a close look at um, you know, their, their tariffs and make sure that they're classified correctly. We at Scarborough are always going to tell you paying more for the right tariff is the better way to go because in the end, that's going to cost you a lot more, a lot less money than customs coming after you because you were misclassifying something to dodge an additional 3% in tariffs. And they will come after you hard for that. They will. If they get an inkling that that's going on, you could expect a 100% exam 100% of the time. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, one specific example is we've got a client that's been with us for 15, 20 years, uh, since long before my time here. Um, they brought in a new compliance person and that compliance person saw that there were some things that they were not doing right and they did a complete overhaul of their database. We had upwards of 240,000 parts in our database and we wiped all of that clean because they wanted to make sure that they were uh, getting the right tariffs in there. And what that led to was they did have some exams for a while because they suddenly uh, started seeing more exams because they saw a whole bunch of different tariffs. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, there's also certain things like random checks because just like at the airport, some people randomly get selected for an exam. That's just part of the process. Uh, Random checks are um, more popular at the border too. Um, but the random check could be computer generated yep. or it could be CBP agent generated. If he just decides that day he's gonna look at every 10th truck, then that's what he's gonna do. 
All right, so um, another thing to think about is new importers are very likely to have exams on their first shipment or two, uh, just because Customs wants to make sure that you're doing everything right. So that's something that we see really, uh, really often as a new importer gets an exam on their first couple of shipments, just to make sure that they know what they're doing. Um, and then obviously anything that has quota, anything that has uh, statistical quantities that are varied, um, Customs wants to pay a little more attention to those and keep an eye on making sure that everything is done correctly on those. Um, factors to consider with exams. Uh, obviously, the type of holder exam is going to play into how much it costs, how much time it takes, um, what has to actually be done with it, um, you know, where it has to go, anything along those lines. Uh, can it stay, it, can it go to uh, just a bonded warehouse? Does it have to go to a customs bonded warehouse? Um, there's a lot of factors to consider and whatever type of hold you're talking about is going to play into that heavily. Um, and another thing that plays into that is uh, your relationship with customs. You know, we at Scarborough, you know, we've been operating in the port of Kansas City for 35 years. Uh, we have a good relationship with the port director of Kansas City and all of the customs officers at Kansas City. Um, and that's not to say that we're, we're leveraging that relationship to do anything, you know, shady or anything like that, but having that relationship with a, a broker that knows what they're doing, that knows, you know, what the right thing to do is, and they trust that we're going to do that, um, that really helps with exams that happen to have uh, to take place in Kansas City. Hey, Caleb, I've got one more question that kind of um, relates to the other slide. Um, some importers are afraid to change customs brokers as they feel that this will place them on a list for exams. Is there any validity to that fear? I would say no. Um, I, I think what most likely happens that they don't see behind the scenes is that when you switch customs brokers, there's a transition period. And things don't necessarily get done exactly the same way from one broker to another if you don't have all of the information up front. Um, you know, if, if that's a commodity that the new broker isn't used to handling and they say put some FDA information in there that's a little different from what the previous broker is, that's a red flag for them. Um, but I, I would say that most likely what they're seeing is, or what they're not seeing is that one broker is putting some information in that either wasn't requested before or was requested and was left off before. Um, and most likely that's causing that kind of uh, impression that the broker switch is what's causing the exam. Thank you. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the different types of exams or holds and then exams uh, after that. Um, so there's a few different types of holds. I'm not gonna say that these are every single type of hold, but this is the most, these are the most common ones. Um, you've got a manifest hold, which is a very common one. That's kind of just a generic hold. They put a hold on the entire container. Um, they're, they're just checking out some of the documentation. They wanna make sure that everything is documented correctly. Um, commercial enforcement hold, that's usually going to be things along the lines of trademarks, um, re uh, you know, copyright, things like that. Um, that's going to be a red flag for customs. So if you're bringing in something that has Nike on it, they're going to look at that and make sure that you have the right to use that Nike name brand on the goods that you're bringing in because uh, counterfeit is a big problem with customs and it's one of the things that they police. And Nike pays you know, or any other company pays to have their trademark and copyright um, enforced by customs too. So um, they're just doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, contraband enforcement team, uh, you see there below the AT set hold. Uh, the AT there stands for anti-terrorism uh, and then contraband enforcement team. Um, there's obviously, this is gonna be more common from those countries that um, don't have, you know, a great political situation, um, don't have a great relationship with the U.S. That's something that tends to be put on those shipments, uh, and it's just customs wanting to make sure that everything is above board on those with regards to making sure that everything on there is safe. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing in there that's going to harm the U.S., whether intentionally or otherwise. Uh, it doesn't necessarily they think, mean that they think there's a bomb on there, but it means that they, they have reason to suspect that things from that country require an extra eye before they allow them into the U.S. 
uh, statistical validation hold. We don't see this one too often because there's actually a process within uh, the entry summary that tells us that there's a statistical reporting issue. Um, but this is something along the lines of if you've got a census error, let's say you're importing something that uh, this, what's called the statistical quantity is um, NO for number. So customs wants to know how many of that item are coming in and you're importing a million dollars worth of those and you report that you're bringing in five of them. Those five things are very expensive and it's outside the historical reporting for that item. That's the sort of thing that we would see a statistical validation hold on because they're thinking that you've probably not classified that correct if that information you've reported is right. Um, and then the next next one is kind of a group, but PGA holds. So a USDA or APHIS hold, Fish and Wildlife, FDA, uh, CPSC, uh, uh, EPA, uh, those are actually usually going to be separate from actual customs exam holds. Those are usually going to be um, on what's called the PGA line. So for FDA, let's say we submitted FDA information and our entry came back with a customs release, but what we see is that we have what's called an FDA hold intact message. That means that some of the data that you transmitted, whether it's the documentation, whether it's the FDA information itself, has flagged FDA to take another look at that, and FDA wants to make sure that you're not delivering that those goods, make sure you're not putting them into the commerce of the US before FDA says, yes, we're good. Um, and then once you go through that exam, you'll get what's called an FDA may proceed message or a, a USDA may proceed message, which means exactly what it sounds like. You can go ahead with that shipment. They've found everything to be above board. Um, in terms of actual exam types, uh, there's about four. The most basic one is a uh, vehicle and cargo inspection system. Uh, yeah, system called a VACUS exam. We refer to it usually as an x-ray exam. It's the simplest, it's the quickest, and most importantly, it's the cheapest. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> it's the least intrusive of all of the exams, and it, um, it goes pretty quick. It, it, it usually goes pretty quick, depending on what port you're in and what kind of volume they have. Yeah. Um, the next one in line is a tailgate exam. And it is an intrusive exam. They do open up the doors and they um, pull out something on the rear of the container, open it up, and if they're satisfied with that, then they seal it back up, close the doors, and off they go. Uh, next up, you got the intensive exam. This is the one where, that really starts hurting. Uh, this is the one that causes the delays and the additional fees usually. Uh, the intensive exam means that they've done more than that tailgate exam, whether it was that initial tailgate exam uh, yielded something that made them want to take another look, or if they skipped the tailgate exam and they just said, hey, this is a commodity that we wanna take a really good look at. We're gonna flag this, we're gonna open up the container. Uh, they may go so far as to unload the entire container, open up boxes, take samples. Uh, this one really has a broad uh, view in terms of what they could possibly do with the exam. Uh, so that we'll talk about that a little specifically here in a minute. Um, PGA exams, that's going to be things uh, for your USDA and APHIS, your Fish and Wildlife FDA. Um, most of those are done through uh, ACE, the automated commercial environment. So your broker will get a message back from their system saying that that organization wants to take a look. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold here, sorry. Um, you will usually get a message through ACE that says, you know, FDA wants to take a look at this. That's when you'll get a hold intact message. That's when you will see um, FDA will want information in what's called ITAX, um, where you have to go on and upload documentation to that particular customs entry so the FDA can take a look. And uh, it will have to deliver to a facility where FDA can actually access that product and open it up and take a look at what they want to take a look at. Now, typically the broker will um, do all that on behalf of the importer, correct? Yes, um, when necessary. Uh, some of these things, uh, so like a Bacchus exam, that happens automatically if it's flagged. You know, all of that gets taken care of at the port. Uh, usually the broker doesn't have to do anything. No truckers have to be called to get anything moved. Um, the more intrusive your exam, 
the more likely it is that either your forwarder or your your broker, whoever you decide to have handle that, um, usually that's when you have to get in and get your hands dirty and say, hey, you need to get a trucker, move it to this exam site, get all the fees paid, and then move it back to the port. Okay, so um, before we move forward, um, I know that you guys are, might get a little bit more specific on each exam. You, you have answered a lot of those questions on this slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask some other questions that have um, been asked. One is, um, are customs exams per container or per bill of lading? And if it's per bill of lading, do all the containers on that bill of lading get examined? Uh, usually, it's by container. I mean, if there's one container on one bill of lading, the answer is yes, it's both. Um, but I have personally seen where um, one particular container on a bill of lading gets called for an exam. Uh, the downside is that usually what that means is that none of those containers, if they're scheduled to move inland, do move inland. They sit at the port, they don't move on the rail, they can, they can collect demurrage while you wait for the exam on that one single container. So um, they are only going to examine that one container or two containers out of five, however many. Um, but what ends up happening is it does actually hold up all of the containers on that bill of lading. Okay, and then what happens if um, one of those containers or the, the goods inside during an intensive exam are damaged? Can CBP be held liable for those damages? It's a very difficult situation. Um, if it is um, damaged by customs, the only way that you can reconcile that with customs is through a congressional tort. And that means getting your congressman involved, getting him to write letters. So it's very, very difficult, very time consuming and very negative, you know. Um, so the answer is yes, but I've only seen it done once in my 40 year career. Thank you. All right, well, let's move forward. So uh, targeting system data. Uh, this is gonna be a little anomalous. I apologize for that, but that's mostly because there's some things that customs just won't tell you at the end of the day. Um, and what we can tell you is that each shipment that comes into the United States is uh, basically given a score with regards to um, where it's coming from what the commodity is, who's involved in the shipment, uh, country of origin, things like that. Um, each of these data points has a certain score associated with it. And if you reach a threshold, you will trigger an exam. Uh, so the things that kind of give customs the data to be able to look into this are uh, for air and ocean, the AMS information. So what's provided to them prior to the sailing. Um, and kind of paired with that is the ISF. So your ISF is going to tell them, you know, who's, who manufactured it, who's selling it, who's buying it, what it is, where it's made, uh, where it's going. Where it's going. Um, you know, so they get quite a bit of information right off the bat before that vessel even sails. And that gives them a lot of information to say, yeah, we're going to want to take a look at this. Or, no, this looks pretty good. We're good. Um, and then prior to the arrival into the U.S., the, the customs entry, um, if you have that filed before it enters the U.S., um, you send that information off to customs, that can trigger the exam because enough, you know, points or that score was met in order to trigger the hold. Um, but like I said, uh, this is about as specific of information as you're going to get on that. Um, like I referred to earlier, if you're asking a customs officer why your shipment was held, um, you're, you're talking to a brick wall most of the time uh, because they are not going to share that information with you. They take their job very seriously, which they should. Um, and they are going to say, basically, you have the information that you need. You know what we want from you in order to proceed. You need to get us what we asked for in order to proceed. So uh, let's spend a little more time talking about the specific types of exams. Uh, Vakas exam, as I mentioned earlier, is the first level of exam. Uh, it's non-intrusive. Uh, NII stands for non-intrusive exam. It's done via x-ray. Uh, Kim's got a great picture there of a container at the port going through one of those machines for x-ray. Um, that happens automatically at the port. 
uh, something gets flagged, it goes through, it gets done. Uh, it, it's the shortest amount of time, it's the cheapest. Uh, it can take two to four days depending on the port. Uh, as Deb referenced, you know, it depends on what port you're at, how busy they are, what time of year it is. Um, if you've got a big swell of containers because we just got off of, you know, uh, China National Golden Week and we've got, you know, 60% more containers than normal, this exam and any other exam is going to take more days because they are just that backlogged. It won't stop them from triggering the exam. It'll just put it in line. Yep. Uh, and once that exam is triggered, you're not getting it off. They have to complete their process before they're going to remove that hold. Don't believe I've ever you know, not that I really would, but I don't think I've ever heard somebody try and convince a customs officer not to examine a container because it's urgent or because they promised they did everything right. Uh, once that exam is flagged, it's going to happen. Uh, the fees generally range from $250 to $500, depending on the port. Um, I, I can't say that the size of the container really matters because they're just rolling it through that machine. So, uh, the, the biggest factor that's going to affect your, your cost there is just the, the fees. Yeah, the port. The yeah. Port. yeah. Uh, the second level of uh, exam that Deb talked about a little bit already uh, is the tailgate exam. That is also usually completed at the port. Uh, I've seen things moved for that. Uh, it's pretty unusual, but it can happen. Uh, what they'll do is they'll break the seal on that container, they'll open it up, they'll look inside, they might take one of those boxes off and uh, open it up and see, all right, the invoice or the bill of lading says this is uh, forklift parts. That looks like a, you know, a motor for a forklift that checks out. I'm gonna put this back on, we're gonna call it good. This one doesn't take a whole lot longer than uh, a VACUS exam, probably about the same range. Um, can get a little more expensive, starts on the low end, goes up to as high as $600, maybe $700. Uh, like with all of these other exams, that's gonna depend on the port. Um, so if you've got one on a particular port, uh, you might be paying a little more than the last one you did. And, and that's just, that's port's discretion. And none of these charges include any demurrage. So once your container arrives or your shipment arrives, you have X amount of days to move it. And if customs has designated this an intensive exam, you might not be able to clear that within that allotted time. So you might um, want to consider demurrage in that as well, because you only get three to four days at the port. Yep. So um, that's something you needed to know. Hey, I uh, got some questions in here. How are the updated sales communicated? And when an exam is done and the seals are broken, who's responsible to let the importer know about it and provide the new seals? How does that work? So usually when we get uh, an updated seal number, it'll come from uh, the steamship line because they're the ones that the terminal is communicating with about the exam. Um, if it's an exam that you facilitated because something had to be moved, oftentimes you'll be in contact with the folks who put that new seal on, they might tell you. Um, in terms of actually who is responsible, I would say that the furthest responsible goes is the steamship line, uh, most likely. So, and if they have a missing seal, you know, if something happens and they have a missing seal, the rail might be in charge. If, you know, if it got to the rail and it didn't have a seal on it, the rail might be in charge. So it's the carrier more than likely that is in charge of putting the new seal on and notifying everyone. But the broker in this instance, most of the time will get that information and pass that on to the importer. Yes, yes. I mean, especially if you're working with Scarborough, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so basically that, that information is usually communicated. Um, I know that if, if there is an exam on a container, um, your, your account rep will most likely be in contact with the steamship line or somebody who has that revised seal number uh, and, and they should be able to get that information over to the importer so that if it arrives on their dock, especially if they've got, you know, they're delivering to a place that's really stringent on their delivery requirements, uh, having the wrong seal on something is a big red flag. So obviously you would want to make sure that you're communicating that. Um, now the broker is going to do that because it's kind of part of their job, but um, if they are not communicating that with you, communicate that to them that you need that information uh, because that means that you are potentially causing yourself a problem 
and uh, most likely your broker is going to fight back and uh, if they weren't given that information. So it's best to just ask for it up front and make sure that they get it before that container delivers. Great. Thank you. Yep. Intensive exams are the ones that aren't fun. Well, none of them are fun. Well, no, none of them are fun. This is least fun. This is least fun. So uh, we call this the last level of, of exam. It's very intrusive. Uh, this is usually done at a customs exam site or a CES. Um, they will, basically what will have to happen is that container will have to be moved from the port to a CES. And then that CES will usually devan the container. Uh, they might segregate it by house bill so that if customs flags something for an int intensive exam uh, and it was really just one of the house bills on that container that they wanted to look at, they, they will know exactly where to go. Um, and they will make that product available for US Customs to inspect, take samples, whatever needs to be done. Uh, this one's not quick. It is going to take usually about a week. Um, if you've got a decent CES, if they're not backed up, uh, two weeks is not uncommon. Uh, the bad news is that there is no amount of time that they have to get this done in. And I think that that's something we were uh, going to talk about a little later, but now is kind of a natural time for that. Uh, there is nothing keeping customs or a CES from holding onto that container until they can get to it. Uh, whether that's two days, whether that's three weeks, I have honestly seen exams go on for six weeks. Um, sure, it's not the longest it's ever happened. I don't think we want to talk about records. Well, that's up there though. Uh, but it's possible and you can kick and scream with customs, you can kick and scream with the CES, but at the end of the day, if customs isn't coming out and examining that freight, they're not letting it go. Uh, and, and that's obviously a big problem with importers. It's, it's impossible to plan for. Um, it's unfortunately one of the prices of importing, uh, one of those unknown costs that you need to be able to account for in some way, but uh, it is something that you need to be aware of that there is not a limit on how long that can take. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the exam only fees. Let's talk about all the other fees that might be involved with moving that container to the CES because those fees that you see right there may not be the only fees that you, um, that you are um, required to pay in an intensive exam. Absolutely. So. Um, what will happen is usually um, sometimes the port will arrange the move themselves to the CES and then they'll arrange the move back from the CES back to the port. In those situations, what will usually happen is you will get a kind of an all-in-one bill. Um, it might break down the charges by, you know, this is what you paid the trucker, this is what you paid the laborers at the CES. Um, but oftentimes we will just get a bill that says exam. $1,700 uh, and we would have to fight to get that broken down into what the individual parts are. Um, the fees, um, so let's say if you were responsible for getting the, the container to the exam site or your broker or your forward or whoever you elect to do that. Um, if that, depending on the port, is what happens, your broker or your forwarder will hire a trucker to dray that container to the exam site so you'll have a dray of, you know, four or $500, depending on your port, depending on your trucker. Um, you will have fees to unload that container. So labor to unload the container. You will likely have a uh, storage with that CES because if it's there for a long time, they're not just letting you take up space in their warehouse for free. And you will have fees for reloading the container and then you will have a fee for draining that container back to the port. Uh, so that's just the exam itself. Uh, you can also potentially have uh, what's called detention. Uh, per diem is what it used to be called. The steamship lines have mostly updated their terms. They call it detention now. Um, you can start actually accruing per diem or detention because that container has been out from the port for so long on that exam. So just like if you have a container delivered direct from the port to your door and you let it sit in your door for a week and a half, you're probably gonna have a couple of days of per diem or detention. 
the same thing applies here, even though it went to a CES and it wasn't actually available for you to unload. So you can have hundreds of dollars in per diem or, or detention, and that has to be paid before they'll even release the container sometimes. Uh, it's, it's one of the ugly sides of these exams. It's really, it's, uh, I think I can count on one hand out of all the times that I've done an exam like this, that I've ever been able to convince someone to waive any part of those fees. And usually it was because the steamship line screwed something up. Uh, if everything went as planned, they're probably not budget on that. Hey, Caleb, I've got a couple other questions. Um, when they're taking those products out of the container, if they are perishable or required refrigeration um, goods, is there the proper storage at those CESs? Uh, usually, if you are moving things in, let's say it's a, a 20 foot or a 40 foot reefer, the CES that they send it to should be equipped with the equipment to make sure that that stays at whatever temperature. Um, they might have more of a general cooler rather than one that they can set at the specific temperature for, you know, something that's USDA might have to be between 5 and 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, they may not have the, the facilities to do something that specific, but usually the CES that they send it to will be equipped enough to at least keep it in a cooler environment than ambient temperature. Okay, perfect. And then you had mentioned before about... Um, different house bills on a master. So let's talk about um, that in like LCL terms. How does an LCL shipment moving through an intensive exam work? So um, basically what's gonna happen there, the process itself is gonna be exactly the same. Um, they're gonna move it to a CES, they're gonna unload it and segregate it. Customs is gonna look at what they wanna look at. Um, and then once that is all is said and done, those charges from uh, the CES or the port or whoever bills those out, that's gonna be prorated across that entire master bill, basically by how much space in that container your shipment took up. Uh, so if you had one pallet and a 40 foot container, your exam fees for that are gonna be pretty low. But if you had 20 CBMs in that 40 foot container, you're gonna be pr paying a pretty good chunk of those exam fees yourself. Uh, so basically what you're saying is just as you buy LCL freight, you share the cost of the container with other importers. And even though your shipment may not be the one that's flagged for exam, you're going to share those costs based on how much it, size it takes up in the container with everybody else in that container. That is correct. Awesome. All right, let's move forward. So a USDA exam, uh, the purpose of this exam is to protect the environment. Um, in terms of how intrusive the exam is, it could be as little as USDA requesting documents. So we would upload those to DIS. I actually don't remember off the top of my head if USDA is integrated into ACE yet, but um, they are, um, they can request documents or they can hold for an intensive exam. Um, there's also something called an FSIS inspection, which um, actually doesn't even require a hold. Your product, certain products are just subject to an FSIS inspection every single time they come into the country. Um, and you have to, or your broker has to arrange the delivery to that FSIS inspection site and get it there, have it examined, and have it released. Um, in terms of how long the, the exam takes, it depends on the product. Um, if you are dealing with something that is easily evaluated, uh, it's in easily marked containers, custom or USDA knows exactly what they're looking for, uh, it, it can take a day. Uh, if you've got uh, giant vats that you're shipping uh, in, you know, uh, I don't remember what they're called, uh, oh. totes, um, and, you know, the measurements aren't as easy and it's a little harder to get into it, the sampling could take longer. Um, they might have to send it off site to evaluate it. That might not be a quick process. So this one has got a really, really broad range of uh, how long the exam takes. Hey, Caleb, um, is there an easy way to determine when an exam is flagged by a specific PGA so we can know exactly who to contact and what documents to provide? Uh, usually, if, especially if it's a PGA that we transmit through ACE, because we do still do some um, on like fish and wildlife, for instance, Fish and Wildlife is one that we don't currently report through ACE. We actually go on to Fish and Wildlife's website. I think they're working on the pilot for that, but it's not released yet as far as I know. Um, we would actually be in contact with them before it's even flagged. 
um, USDA or FDA, we will submit that information through ACE and we will get a message back in our system telling us if more information is required. Uh, and usually your broker takes care of that. So if you've got an FDA line that says, hey, hold this intact, your broker needs to go onto what's called ITAX, um, which is basically FDA's website online and enter information, tell them what entry number it's re uh, regarding, upload documents, and then wait for FDA's instruction from there. Thank you. Um, in terms of the exam fees from USDA, that's gonna vary entirely by what facility you're at, what type of sampling has to take place. Um, it could be just a couple hundred bucks. It could be, you know, if they have to take a sample, send it off for testing, get it back, reevaluate something else, you know, you could be looking at somewhere up in the thousands of dollars. It's, it's kind of hard to tell on that. Great. So for our um, FDA exam, uh, the purpose of this is to protect the people. Obviously, FDA regulates uh, food and drug, at Food and Drug Administration, obviously. Um, so if you're bringing in something that is consumable by humans, most likely the FDA is going to have a hand in it. They're going to want to make sure that it's safe to be consumed by humans. Um, and something to keep in mind that a lot of importers are not aware of, um, even if the item that you have is not intended to be consumed by humans or is not intended to be a food contact um, uh, not intended to be a food contact item. So let's say you're importing a decorative plate. If that plate could be something that has food on it, FDA wants to know about it. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, this is kind of like the USDA review. Um, it could be anywhere from a document document review to a hold intent, hold intact intensive exam. Uh, pretty similar timetable depending on what's sampling. And again, the fees are going to depend on what needs to be done and where it's at. Uh, exams at the North American border, we've got Canada, uh, we've got tailgate and intensive exams, which are basically just kind of like a tailgate exam at the port. They're going to pop it open, they're going to look, if it checks out, they're going to close it up. Uh, they may need to be dra or pulled off to the side to an inspection facility. Which um, is completed at a location um, near the bridge crossing. So when, when the truck crosses the border, or gets ready to cross the border, they approach the customs inspector and he will let them know whether they need to go down to the, I don't know what they call it, an import lot or an intensive lot. And then th there are um, there are other <clears throat> customs inspectors down there and they just go, they just go through a line. So um, how long it takes depends on what they find. And um, it's usually pretty quick. Um, if they find something bad, it won't be quick and it won't be cheap, but charges rarely occur on the tailgate or even a somewhat intensive exam. And Mexico has somewhat of the same system. It, it is a little different um, in terms of there, you know, there's literally red light, green light. There is. <laughs> has anybody ever traveled um, down to Mexico and come back? When you come back in the United States, at least if you come through Houston, I think, um, they had you press a, a, a button. If it went red light, you had to go see the customs guy. If it went green light, you could go on your merry way. It's the same thing with freight. They have, those trucks actually push that red light, green light, and then they are told whether or not there's going to be an intensive exam, and they approach the border. If it's green light, that does not mean that it won't be an intensive exam once it gets there. Because again, they're human. They make decisions on the spot with paperwork and all that other stuff. So um, how long it takes depends on what they find. <coughs> and then the brokers on the Mexican border usually have a stevedore that would help them with um, unloading and reloading containers that were examined. Uh, and there are some fees that are associated with exams at uh, the Mexican border. Those are usually invoiced by the stevedore, and then you'll get a bill from your broker whenever that's done. So uh, the, big, the big questions, how to avoid exams. Uh, most importantly, have reliable partners in place before you complete the purchase order. That is everything from your shipper to your freight forwarder to your broker. 
um, because if your shipper's not documenting things correctly, that's gonna cause you problems. If your forwarder doesn't know the best routing, uh, that could cause you problems. If your broker doesn't know how to file an FDA entry, how, that they don't know that you need to file FDA or APHIS on something, that's gonna cause you problems. So you need to make sure you're working with reliable, knowledgeable people. Um, if you plan to import more than one time, you probably need to do a continuous bond. Um, basically, that's because if you are doing a single entry bond, Customs is gonna see you more likely as a first time importer because that's kind of a red flag for them. We talked about first time importers being more likely to get an exam. So the continuous bond helps them see, you're gonna be a regular importer. I can probably rely a little bit more on you to know what you're doing. Um, documents, documents, documents. Please get your documents to the broker as soon as you possibly can because if customs flag something and you don't have documents up front, the longer you wait, the more frustrated they're gonna get and it is more likely that your stuff is gonna sit because they're gonna put you on the back of the line because they don't have what they need. Um, file ISF accurately and on time. You've got to file that 24 hours in advance. If you're shipping to the Port of Savannah and you have an ISF that's not done the day after it's sailing, you are likely to get a $5,000 fine from customs because that port specifically is real, real serious about that. Uh, so filing ISF accurately on time is always important, but especially if you're shipping to certain ports. Um, ensure your HTS number is correct. Work with your broker. Make sure that you've got the right HTS number. Um, you know, Scarborough offers free consulting calls of 30 minutes if you've got questions on your tariffs. Um, they want to make sure, we want to make sure that you're doing everything correct just like you do. Make sure that you're not getting into trouble with customs because uh, unfortunately with customs, not knowing the answer is not a pass. Uh, again, back to the documentation, detailed commodity description is an absolute must. Uh, you, we've had an importer before bring in uh, empty pen casings and they listed them as uh, dead bodies on the invoice, uh, which is very, very bad. Don't put dead bodies on your invoice uh, because that was a very confusing red flag for customs and you bet that, that shipment went on exam. Um, refer to the 19 CFR, uh, I believe it's 152 for valid valuation to make sure that you're putting the correct pricing on your invoices. Um, avoid importing from high risk countries. We've talked about those, um, you know, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan, those are places that customs sees as less stable and they want to examine things because they want to make sure everything is okay. Um, Find out required licensing or certificates from PGAs. So make sure you have your FDA information in line. Make sure that you've got, you know, if you're bringing in something that's going to be subject to USDA, have your health certificate, your vet certificate, anything like that. Because if, again, if you don't have that at the time of importing, those partner government agencies are going to be wondering why you didn't have that already. Uh, and then the last thing is to become CTPAT certified. Uh, CTPAT is a program that basically, uh, it's called Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. We'll talk about that for just a second. Um, you know, the benefits are reduced number of CBP exams, uh, front of the line for inspections, possible exemption from those randomized stratified exams, uh, shorter wait times at the border. Uh, there's just, you can go on and on with the list of CTPAT benefits, but it's a it's not an easy process to get through. You've got to make sure you know what you're doing and you have to absolutely make sure that your entire supply chain from shipper to end user is in line uh, in order to qualify for CTPAT. But I do know they've recently required or revised some of their uh, benefits. Uh, they're trying to make it more beneficial to entice more people to use it. Um, so if you want to ask about CT, Pat, you can obviously reach out to myself or Deb. We'll get you with our consulting team here at Scarborough and uh, find out if CT, Pat is something that you're interested in or, you know, if you could really benefit from it. Uh, what to watch out for if you, uh, if customs triggers an exam and they find something, you're looking at more exams down the road. You know, we've had an importer that we had done things for for 20 years. They had been, done everything the exact same and then customs decided to examine a container and found something wrong. They got exams for probably a good month or two after that because customs knew that they had had a problem and now they wanna make sure they fix it. 
Um, uh, you can get flagged for exam if classification changes on something they've been doing al already previously. Uh, so make sure that if you're changing your tariff, you have the backup to say that's right. Um, new or different items being imported from the same shipper, Customs takes a look at that. Um, if you're switching ports, we call that port shopping, um, especially if you've mainly done one port previously. Uh, have a good reason because Customs is going to take a look if you're switching ports. Um, don't pick anything up from the port if it's under a hold an FDA hold intact message. We just had this problem uh, with one of our clients. Trucker picked it up and tried to deliver it. We got an FDA hold intact message. They missed the, the fact that we had done that. Uh, and that shipment moved all the way to Kansas City from, I think, Norfolk uh, and had to go all the way back because FDA wanted to take a look. And that's real expensive. Uh, and then back to documents, be specific. Do not be vague on your documents. If you have an air filter that's specifically for tractors, say air filter for tractor. Don't just say filter because customs is not going to accept that. Okay. Um, if you guys are okay, we still have several questions. You mind if we go about five minutes over? I'm good with that. I'm okay. Um, so, on the CT pack questions, we have a lot that came in um, in regards to that. Um, I think that we'll take that outside of this webinar. So please contact that consulting email right there. Um, ask your questions uh, in regards to CT pat and exams um, and all the details for CT pat, and we will get to you directly. Um, the next question is: Does becoming an FTZ affect the possibility of exams? A foreign uh, no. trade zone. Not necessarily. FTZ, as Kim said, is a foreign trade zone. Um, it kind of allows you to operate uh, kind of as an external warehouse, not technically part of the commerce of the U.S. Um, but honestly, they're going to look at things just as closely that go into an FTZ as they are um, things that just come into the port because uh, technically it is a foreign entity foreign trade zone so it's seen just as importing from another country so you're you're just as likely to get customs exams from there as you are from importing from east coast west coast wherever thank you if customs does a random exam on a container and they find that everything is fine do we still get charged yep uh if customs does an exam all that matters is that somebody did a thing to that container. Um, and something to, that a lot of folks don't really take into consideration, Customs is not the one making money on those exams. Those exams are charged by the terminal. They're charged by the CES, the uh, Customs Exam Station. Uh, CBP does not make a dime off of those exams. So that's why they vary from port to port because the terminal has the right to uh, decide what they do and don't exam and how um, how much they charge for it. So um, unfortunately, yeah, no, that those fees are going to get charged because basically what's happening is somebody is doing a job and as they see it, they need to be paid for the job that they do. Thank you. Do export shipments also get U.S. Customs exams? Uh, Honestly, I think we're, we're mostly trying to focus on the import exams, but um, I, I think that the, the regulation system for exports works a little differently. Um, they, they use something similar to the HTS um, called Schedule B that's similar, but is a little different. Um, they've got different export controls. So um, I think that that's probably a question that's better directed to our consulting email um, because they're gonna be able to better direct you towards an answer on that. But also, I would, I would answer that as, yes, export shipments from the U.S. do get customs exams by other countries. So you, what you need to do is just work with your uh, freight forwarder or your broker and find out what documents are required so that way you don't get flagged for an exam in another country as well. That would be fair. Um, I've got a, a couple of other questions here. Um, is it the HTS code that determines what PGA is required for a commodity? Now, these don't really have to do with exams, but we might as well ask, sure. uh, answer them right now. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, at the end of the day, the number that your broker plugs into the system 
is what flags a PGA for being required or not required. Uh, something that is in chapter, you know, one of the lower chapters that are food uh, are going to flag for FDA and possibly USDA. Whereas something that's in chapter 73, which is steel, steel and uh, iron and steel, I believe, um, is not gonna flag for FDA most likely, uh, unless it's in one of those, what we call catch all tariffs, which is other items of iron or steel, other, 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 other. Um, the, the tariff is what is going to require you to claim or disclaim uh, PGA information. Excellent. Um, now, are there specific types of importers or specific commodities that get um, intensive exams more often than others? For example, like a medical device importer? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, there are some, ex there are some commodities that literally just always have to be examined. Um, we've got importers that bring in, you know, hydrolyzed proteins and they have to be examined at an FSIS inspection every single time because they are regulated by the USDA and USDA checks those every single time. So to some extent, yes, there are some importers and some commodities that uh, are going to be always examined more than others. And as you mentioned before, Caleb, um, a lot of the commodities that are flagged for exam are related to a PGA some way mm -hmm. or another. Absolutely. Okay, this last question that we have um, is more of a subjective question, but I will go ahead and ask it and let you guys answer. How many brokers should a company have? One, and it should be Scarborough. <laughs> <laughs> and just for the record, that's my answer too. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, there's, I, there are a lot of um, benefits to going with one U.S. customs broker, um, yeah. especially when it comes to like data analytics and optimizing your supply chain, um, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But that's it for all the questions. I appreciate you guys staying a little bit later and to all the attendees that stayed a little bit later. Um, you guys did an excellent job explaining everything today. And um, Thank you to everybody that came and please feel free to reach out to us with any other questions that you have. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. Thank you.